person of value takes up a great space by not being there. Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. (laughs) And inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. So here's my story. I was approached in July or so uh, by this organization out of New York, and I have since checked, and and they're a legitimate organization, and their their purpose in contacting me was to see if I was interested in what they they called a partnership, but really it's a brokered arrangement under which they would set me and my firm up with high-level meetings, which they call summits, with Um, in-house counsel for large organizations, large national organizations that have litigation budgets and Mm. local counsel, in my case, in Maryland. And what they do is they choose firms um, in different jurisdictions. And so they set up that brokered arrangement. And in exchange for that, uh, you pay what to us is a considerable a considerable amount of money, but you know if you get two, three, four of these companies and it's a constant stream of cases, then the ROI could probably pay off. It it, it could probably be realized, but it would be a considerable investment to uh, see you know on the chance that this would be successful. And when they approached, we were in the middle of, you know, we had just finished our first like three months of COVID Mm, right, right, right. working virtually. We had pretty much figured out how things were working with the company. And it was not an arrangement that I was really familiar with, had any experience with, and I wasn't in the mood to try it. I didn't see the necessity of, of trying it. So I told them that I wasn't interested and they asked if they could contact me again. And I said, sure, you know, the door is always open. Okay. So, uh, about a week or two ago, they contacted me again. They said they had a new uh, sort of business model. It would still wind up being the same kind of investment, but it was staged and they had specific people to introduce and there were different summits that are in-person and virtual and they had adopted their uh, adapted their business model to remote as well because they, they had focused on in-person meetings. And I was speaking to, I had uh, Lacey from my firm on both of the calls, the one in July and the one recent. And we were talking about it and we had to get over two hurdles. The first one we got over, which was, well, this isn't something we've done before. We've always generated our own business. We've always developed our own leads. And, and you know, that's how we, we developed our client bases through referrals and word of mouth and that sort of thing. And this is completely different. Mm-hmm. We could get over that hurdle philosophically. The second hurdle is what we could not get over. And that was really in conversation with, with Lacey. What came out was, you know, I can't remember whether it was me or whether it was Lacey who said, okay, well, let's take a look at this. What if it were successful? We've been focusing so much on what if it fails and we've spent all this money for these meetings and they deliver, but we didn't secure any business. What if it fails? The question really was, well, what if it doesn't? What if it's Mm. And that meant that we would get a whole bunch of these types of cases for this type of client. And And how, I'm curious how would you feel about like what is a I, I, there's a reason i'm asking but i'm going to pause and just let you finish your story go ahead well, so that's what we focused on i was i actually started talking to lacy about well let's put ourselves at you know forgetting about covid for a minute let's put ourselves at the you know sitting down together at the celebration dinner mm-hmm. saying we just got all of this business what kind of celebration would that be and we decided it wasn't that particular celebration in light of that business wouldn't be, yeah, it wouldn't be a fist pump type celebration. It would be, yay, well, we got all of this. So oh. here's here's the reason I asked, which is really funny and actually makes me feel a lot better um, given where this story ended up because here was my experience of the last however many minutes it's been. Um, and I'll give you a hint. I might guess more minutes than it was <laughs> because... <laughs> I was having the rare experience of having a hard time paying attention. Like there was, in retrospect, I think it's because there was no verve in your voice. Like you were describing a thing and it was when someone's not, it's one of the things I actually pay attention to. Like if I, if I get bored listening to a client or whatever, that it's not that they're being boring. It, It probably means that there's not a lot of like 
excitement or yeah. you know, genuine interest for them and what like that they're bored with the thing. Now, so um, not like I have some sixth sense, but that didn't occur to me with you because I was listening with a different set of ears. And I don't know, sometimes I wish people could see the video. You're talking and I'm like putting on chapstick, <laughs> trying, I'm like, where's this going? I don't understand. But I think that's actually really telling because you weren't telling it with the like amusement and interest that you tell your stories. And that's because at the end of the day, that celebration dinner wouldn't... Well, first of all, I think an even better question is, would you go on a celebration dinner for getting those Well, that's it. that's checks? the whole thing. I mean, assuming <laughs> assuming that we did, you know, whether it's a celebration dinner or the force of a high five, you know, right. what kind of, what kind <laughs> of joy business joy would be inherent in the accomplishment right. um, that would be a successful venture. So mandatory high five in three, two, yeah. one. So the successful partnership for them would mean that we would get all of this business in. And so, you know, financially it would certainly be helpful, but Lacey and I came to the conclusion that that would be one sad and muted celebration dinner if we that, landed these big clients from that because of the work that they had and, and the what kind we of work to and, do. Yeah. yeah, the kind of work they have. And also, I feel like, I mean, just from what I know about your firm, and I, I don't know how, how like the right way to split legal hair, you know, the hairs of what legal work is. But I feel like you, you and Lacey and everyone at your firm really loves uh, that, like, when your work makes a difference that you can yeah. see and it's like palpable, you can like put your fingers on the pulse of it. And and that's not to say your work wouldn't make a difference in, you know, it would be valuable, obviously, but that's different than I'm helping turn a ship. I mean, you, you, you'd sort of be cranking a cog inside a giant machine. Of yeah, it. Right. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a saying that a person of value takes up a great space by not being there. You know, and wait, 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 what? I'm sorry. What a person of value takes, takes up a great space by not being there. You know, it's just you notice when that person is not there. Oh, oh, my, oh, okay. My sense of the kind of work we'd be doing, it's kind of like dipping your finger in a puddle of water. You take the finger out, and there's no sign that you'd <laughs> ever been there at all. You know, and so yeah, we would we would be able to fill out deposit slips, and you know. Look, don't get me wrong. My mortgage company deeply appreciates my ability to fill out deposit slips. And, and let's be clear, if you were hinging on having to let your core people go, yeah. you would clamor at that work. So it, it's not, it's not, you know, sometimes there are things at play that, that don't allow yeah. you to be that discerning. But if those things aren't there, I think it's often tempting to not be that discerning because you you almost don't notice that you get to ask the question. Yeah. And, and um, I think that the thing for us, I mean, we definitely, especially in a COVID economy, it's, there are uncertainties, but we, one of the things that we and a lot of businesses that have been around for a while have fought really hard to do is to get to ask the question, you know, is this the kind of work we want? And, and understand there was nothing unethical at all about it. There was nothing improper. There was nothing wrong with somebody who takes it, it's just that it's the kind of repetitive work that we would just have to, it's it's the difference between what I get to do and what I have to do. And this is the kind of work that I would have to do. Um, yeah. And, and everything in your, uh, just everything in your demeanor and your tone and like everything about it is like, wah, wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think what's interesting is um, the, the, you said we get to ask those questions, but also it's it's kind of a discipline to ask those questions and to remember that you can ask those questions because I the it's funny I was just listening to a um, a podcast of Brene Brown when she had um, Glennon Doyle on from about a year ago and totally different context it was it was um, they were talking about just being authentic and and honest and not being kind of a martyr as a mother in that moment they were talking about. And Brene tells a story about coming home from a big thing and um, like a, a big speaking tour or something. And as an introvert, she's exhausted. And there was a swim meet and she didn't want to go because she was just exhausted and needed some downtime. And she didn't go. And then she felt bad. And when her son came home, she's like, I'm so sorry I wasn't there. She's all penitent and whatnot. And she said, I just needed some alone time. And and he was just like, all right, whatever. And she felt bad all night long or whatever. Well, the very next day she gets a um, his birthday list or Christmas list or whatever it was, some sort of list, wish, wish list of wants, whatever holiday it was. 
And the first thing on the list was alone time. And she asked him about it. And he said, I didn't know we could ask for that. (laughs) (laughs) And so in that context, she was talking about modeling that. But I think as a leader, you are always, or a parent, you are always modeling what questions that need to be asked and can be asked and should be asked because just because they're not being asked doesn't make the need go away. I mean, I'm not so Pollyanna romanticizing business choices like this to say, you know, it's not an if you build it, they will come kind of thing. Like you will turn that down and set your eyes on your passion, Elliot, and all those projects will come up. It's not that. But what I will say is the more times that you okay, take a thing just because it's there and you're afraid that the next thing won't come, especially if you don't, you know, it's not one of those situations where you don't have a choice because of like dire financial straits. Every time you do that, I feel like you shave off a little bit of the verve (laughs) and chutzpah and like get up and go that increases your chances of having more of what you want. So it is like a like a small death inside kind of well, it is, moment. But, and it's interesting you you mentioned modeling that, you know, from the Brene Brown story, because I've talked a lot, Lacey and I, as a matter of fact, have talked a lot about business development. And um, we've had a lot of conversations based upon the distinction between what she can do, because mm-hmm. she's very talented, she can do a lot. But what kind of, since we're a business law firm, what kind of businesses really interest her? What kind of people really interest her? And Lacey is a very creative person and she likes, you know, she could do somebody that's in industrial distribution or or whatever, but she really likes people that are doing just really interesting work, you know, whether Mm -hmm. that's a a really kind of craftsman-like subcontractor or artists and content creators. And she just likes that. And you can see the difference, just like you heard the difference in how I'm telling the story. You can see the difference in her contemplation of who she wants to have conversations with, Yeah. Um, you know, on whether she has to do it or whether she gets to do it. And there, there's one other thing that this reminds me of, um, because it was my very first job interview as a lawyer. Mm. Um so I had worked for my dad for three years. So I didn't really have to interview for that job. But when I when I left my dad's firm... You've been interviewing was, your whole life. I've been interviewing my whole life. But when I left my dad's firm, I was three years out and I was looking for what, what I was called a real job, you know, a third party <laughs> job. They didn't have to hire me. Sure, your dad appreciated um, that. I, um, I sat down with the senior partner of the small firm in Towson and he said what can you do? You know, his real question was, if I hire you today, what would you do for me to me tomorrow? You know, so what can you do? And I said, I really want to be a business lawyer. That's what I really love. I I like entrepreneurship. I like innovation. I want to be a business lawyer. And he looked at me and he said, I didn't ask you what you want to be. My grandmother wants to be a rocket scientist. I asked you what you can do. And I said, well, I've won jury trials. He goes, great. You're a litigator. Okay, let's talk about that. And I was... A litigator for for quite some time and and I learned that but but his view was really he was not um, focused on my bringing in business he was just focused on my performing a task mm-hmm. and he wanted to know what I could do but right. if you're focused on what people like to do and bring in business and their interest level then you have to go the other way yeah and I think I think there's a time and place for everything I mean in that context, I, I could hear my own brain sort of contradicting 90% of what we were just talking about as I was imagining kind of early career moments of, of mine or other people where you know, I'm a big proponent of, I mean, gosh, in, in college, I cleaned houses for a living and I, not for a living, but I mean, to support myself. And I tried to do that the best I very, you know, the very best I could and to be the absolute best at it. And I tried to make it more efficient and faster. I mean, I used... I threw myself into it. I didn't just go and like clock time and and I I tend to do things that way. It's primarily just like an internal competitiveness kind of thing, but th- I think that's why I got opportunities. You know, you see that a lot where if you you treat it like an important job even if it's by other people's means, you know, even if it's not your favorite thing or even if it's not, you know, if you're the receptionist, be the best damn receptionist there ever was or whatever it is. Um I think there's a lot of value in that of of of, of not being so picky of like, oh, this isn't my favorite thing. I'm not going to take it. Um, but then I do think as you you start off with what you can do, 
in part to discover what you don't want to do <laughs> and then oh. and then honing it in on because then the, the more you can get i mean anyway the fact of the matter is whether we like it or not we do better work when we're engaged and and excited yeah. and find value in it no, I think that's definitely true. One of the things that was valuable for me was really having Lacey on the call because I wasn't just deciding what do I want to do and taking my temperature. Do I like this? Do I not like this? I was trying to decide what what's good for the organization because this would be, you know, a number of people would be involved in this if we were successful. And uh, so it wouldn't just be me. And so I got to have Lacey on the call so that we had a conversation about not what do I, Elliot, what do I want? But what do we as a company, as an organization, what do we want? What would make us really want to go to that celebratory dinner? And what would make us think, no, why? It's just, no, it's yeah. cold outside and I'm staying home. I love that because it, it also, it harkens back a little bit to what I think was last week's episode where we touched on, like, it shouldn't be lonely at the top that, you know, having other people to check in on for validation, like, you know, you have, you may have this. Had you gone by yourself, you may have had that kind of like blah feeling in your belly, but it's too easy to get, you know, to, to have the other 99 thoughts come in at the exact same time, which is yes, but it's revenue and it's my job to support people. And there's a pandemic. And for all we know, work's going to dry up tomorrow. And there's a lot of fears and, and legitimate fears. I mean, you're, you're not being a like, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is yeah. falling. Those are legitimate things. And so it would have been very easy to say yes out of obligation or just lack of clarity that it was a good thing. You have another person there and boom, the decision probably got a lot easier faster because you both are like, yep, yeah. that's the feeling, not loving it. <laughs> well, it did because, you know, Lacey would be, if we had gotten that kind of work in, Lacey would have been frontline. Sure. She would have been doing a lot of that work. And what you what you were just talking about is is exactly correct because I would come to the decision. I did come to the decision um, in part with my well. Let's look at the quarterly results and annual revenue and the um, financial viability or success of the firm. You know that ownership mentality. And Lacey, while all of those things concern her, obviously, um, she looks at it from a frontline, okay, we've got to get this business done. We've got to make the clients happy. We've got to make sure it's integrated into our workflow. And so her perspective, um, different and, and extremely important, was necessary because that's what she was really focused on. And so it was really helpful to speak with her about this. Because she's looking at it frontline and workflow and how this fits and and culture and who do we have to bring in and and I was I was glad to hear her initial reaction. She reached the same conclusion I did, but from a different path. Yeah, which is you know? all the more validating, right? Because yes. it's like two different hypotheses, you know, left their train stations and they got to the same destination. <laughs> One traveling to westbound to Chicago. How many yeah. oranges were in the oh, whatever? <laughs> trying to make that complicated. So so did you turn down the work? It turned down the or work. The potential for the work. Well, right. I turned down the opportunity, told them I was not interested in in pursuing the partnership. And um, you know, I I know that, you know, on my drives home or whenever I'm just alone and if I start to think, oh my gosh, well, I don't know if the phone's going to ring with this opportunity at the right, you know, on the other side, or if this client's going to call or what's going to happen. And I know what my payroll is. And I know, I'm all, all, you know, all that spiral stuff that you get into as a business owner. I know that there might be times that I would kind of be tempted to second guess that, but really not. I have never in my career regretted turning down a client, but I have yeah. often <laughs> regretted accepting <laughs> certain work when the flags are all up, but I've never sure. regretted turning it down. Sure. I, I do think there's a, there's another layer here that's, that's interesting of, it's just very telling about how the brain works. And I'm, I'm making up sort of like a companion story to compare it to here. But I think there's been many times for me where, cause you said something about it being a not small amount of money of an investment or whatever. And there'll be times where I'll look at something and that will be my whole like, well, that's a lot of money and will I get it back? And I'm turning it into this, like I'm throwing my brow, very serious math formula, business mm -hmm. strategy thing. And then something else will come up that I have a very intuitive drive that's like a good thing for me to invest in. That's the same amount of money, maybe even more money. And, and I'm like, that's, I'm doing that. And I don't even think about the dollars. And yeah. so I just, I think it's the, and, and not even just to make it about dollars, just any variable 
I mean, you hear over and over again that our brain makes emotional decisions and then it looks for logical reasons to back that up and validate you know, and, it. And that's true. And what I find interesting from what you said is the mistake that could have gone along with not having that that uh, filter. So for example, let's say it wasn't a large amount of money, which to me was, you know, well into the five figures, mm-hmm. you know, so, so a good amount of money. Yeah. Let's say they came to me with the same opportunity, same credibility, because we vetted them and all that stuff. And they said, it's $500. And I'm not looking down my nose at $500, but it's $500. And I could, I could spend that. The, the mistake that I could have made was said, okay, well, you know, what's $500? Why don't we see? And I would have ignored the larger question of still, do we want success? Yeah, do I want that? this work? Do I want to go down this path? And I think it was it was fortunate that it had a large amount of money as a filter and I could back up and go, well, wait a minute, this is a really important discussion, really important decision. When a lot of times the really important decisions don't look like it. They're not clothed in big dollar signs. And mm-hmm. so you don't recognize until it's farther down the path that that was a really important decision. And I knocked people all off kilter and asked them to do things they didn't want to do. And under the what the hell, let's take a shot umbrella. Oh, yeah. Well, I I actually just had a conversation yesterday. And yes, today is Monday and yesterday was Sunday. And I actually had a client call because it was a like a very urgent kind of thing we had to discuss. And it was very similar to this. It's work that a huge amount of work that in this case, she doesn't have to pay any money to have. Like one of her existing clients called and said, can you, we don't have the internal stuff for this. Can you pick it up and run with it so that we don't, you know, we'd rather you do it than someone else. And there's a million reasons that she should, you know, it's a huge amount of work walking in the door. (laughs) And that again, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And it's a, it's a, she has a very clear strategic plan for this year that will lead to a lot of passive income kinds of kinds of uh, model in her business. And this work is all very labor intensive, would have to hire some people. And it's it's just being really careful about, do I really want this? Is this actually going to add value or does it just look shiny from the outside? And w- which made me think, you know, if it, if it wasn't $500, if it was just that work was knocking on your door, would you take it? Right, right. And so, and that's the, that's different. The last question you asked, does this work really add value? Because the value it would add if we were successful, it came through. The value we would it would add is monetary, but it would not add value to what we do as an organization, who we are, the quality of life, the employee retention, all of those things that are the intangibles that if you're lucky, outweigh the monetary opportunity. Right, right. And 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 I think it's even, there's a further step to that question is, is does it um, drain? Like you're saying, you know, not add yeah. value, but like take away value yeah. either from employee, you know, if it's work that no one wants to do because it's super drudgy or, and it's going to suck the energy out of the firm. Or if it, in her case yesterday, it's a huge risk of getting way off track of their strategic objectives, which absolutely would give everyone a big celebratory dinner. I mean, like that's a, they they have this clear path to something, a great little business. And this is a lot of work. And so again, the revenue feels very appealing and hard to turn away, but you know, we ended the call and she's still thinking about it. I don't know where she's actually going to land just yet, but just really clear on what the costs of, of doing that work is. So yes, it pays a lot, but what is the cost? Because there is always a cost and like, and hopefully it's a, that math formula works out on the positive on the end, but. Well, there's always a cost and there's, you always look a little bit different at the end. And I didn't like how we were going to look. So that's our story. But the discussion doesn't have to end here. No, it does not. In fact, we don't want it to. No, we don't. (laughs) That is why we actually have our private Facebook group. Which we started to make sure that we could get your comments, your rants, your thoughts. Your stories. Your stories. You can find links to that group as well as show notes and links to subscribe via email and how to find us just about anywhere you can possibly find podcasts at SoHere'sMyStory.com. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at SHMS Podcast. 
And since we know it takes a village. Yes, it does. <laughs> we'd like to thank our village, our super talented, incredibly patient team. And occasionally snarky Ooh, team. Yeah, but in the best of ways. In the best Love of it ways. When snarky. Yes. <laughs> Good mockery. So, so a huge shout out to the people who actually help us produce our show. Uh, first, our sound engineer, Tom Hansen. Thanks to Christy Schmier for our brilliant show notes and all the other fantastic writing she does for us. And to Taylor Mathauer for doing just a little bit of everything. Including wrangling us. Including wrangling us. <laughs> Which is no small feat. No, it's not. This is Jody Hume. And I'm Elliot Wagenheim. And you've been listening to So Here's My Story.